So we're going to be looking at these five existential questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And that means when you die. How should I live before you go there? And why? And I think these questions are at the heart of the, the, the human quest for spiritual meaning and awakening from as early as we, we can date the quest. And that every religion has its own way of answering these things. The answers that I'm going to propose are from something called the perennial philosophy. And I'm going to suggest that the perennial philosophy is, is going to answer these questions for a variety, uh, for the majority of people who are what I'm calling spiritually independent. So let me talk for a minute about what this, what these spiritually independent people are or who they, who they are. On the recent Pew Research Center poll on religion in America, they took a look at where people are vis-a-vis -vis organized religion. And they found that the fastest growing group, and you can see it on the uh, slide marked growth of the religiously unaffiliated, and I just don't like these terms, uh, unaffiliated, or we'll see in a second what they call the nuns. Uh, what the fastest growing group in the United States seems to be people who I'm calling spiritually independent. Uh, over the last five years, they, their growth has been, as you can see on the slide, I mean, quite strong. The majority of them are not atheists or agnostics or atheists and agnostics put together. They're people who are searching for something, but not something in or within an organized religious frame. So if you go to the little slide to the left, you see that among those who identify the religion as nothing in particular, the percent who say they are not looking for a religion in particular are 88%. So 2% we don't count. They're just either they don't know whether they're looking or they're not looking. I don't know what that means. Or they just refuse to answer. And then there's 10% who said, no, they'd like to join a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a temple or something. They, they are actually actively looking to one extent or another. But the majority are, uh, of these people are not. So what do you make of that? Well, I read the study. The study suggests that especially with people, and we don't have the breakdown by age, but uh, people under 40, and then the lower you go uh, from 40 down to 20s, the stronger this becomes, that the younger the person, starting around 20 and uh, ending around 40, the younger the person, the less they are motivated to find a religion, and yet the more deeply committed they are to, to the search for meaning. And the Pew, the Pew study suggests that this, well, I don't want to overstate it. One possibility, they say, is that this will change. That as these people get older, they'll join a religion. Or as they get married uh, and have children, they will join a religion. I don't think that's true at all. I, I, don't, I don't see why. If you don't believe in organized religion in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, why all of a sudden, if you have a child, you're going to want to foist that on the child. No, I'm saying foist. It's obviously a prejudicial term. But if you're not looking for a religion and you're part of this, uh, what they're calling religiously unaffiliated, it, voice probably works. But if, if you're not committed to a specific religion, I don't see why you suddenly have a kid and say, oh, that kid's got to be Catholic or that kid has to be Jewish. It, it makes no sense to me. So I don't think it's going to change. On the contrary, I think as the religiously independent have children, their numbers will grow because they will raise spiritually independent or, uh kids into spiritually independent adults. So let me just take another moment to talk about labels here. So in the slides, Pew is calling these people religiously unaffiliated. In their, the text of the report itself, they call them nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And the idea is that on a survey like the Pew survey, when you have to check off your religion, it says Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever else it says, uh, uh, and then none. And so these people check off none. And that's why they're called nuns. None is a negative term. I think religiously unaffiliated is a negative term, though less so. And that a much better term is spiritually independent. 
And what I mean by that is the same as we might, I, I want to use spiritually independent the way we would use politically independent. You know, someone who's politically independent is someone who likes some ideas in the, in, in the Democratic Party and some ideas in the Republican Party and some ideas in the Green Party or the Natural Law Party or the Tea Party or the Libertarian Party. And they just pull together different aspects of what they consider to be wise policy and weave together their own political stance. Spiritually independent people are doing exactly the same thing. They'll see something in Buddhism that speaks to them, something in Catholicism that speaks to them. They'll pull wisdom from wherever they get it. I call these people seekers without borders. They're not interested in the boxes. They'll go wherever they, they feel drawn, find, uh, pick out whatever they, they find themselves attracted to, and then weave it together into their own, their own, uh, now I'm having a problem firefox, but their own system of belief. And when they get married, they will pass that system of belief on to their children, or at least pass the quest ideal on to their children and let their children find their own way the way the parents have found their own way. I find this very positive. I'm very impressed by this whole movement. And, and so maybe I'm overstating it because I, I like the idea. I think it's to a new stage in human spiritual evolution where we're no longer locking ourselves in boundary boxes. Uh, it's no longer the case that just because I'm born Jewish that I can't pull something into my life from, from Catholicism, uh, even if it doesn't meet the Jewish standard and, and vice versa. That I'm, I'm concerned with wisdom and not with upholding the boundaries of any specific religious community. So, so let me just stop there and just see if we're on the same page. Not that you agree necessarily, but if, if you understand what I'm saying, if anyone has any comments uh, regarding that, this is a, a good place to stop. Well, this is Shauna, and um, I, I totally agree and understand, but I think, at least in my mind, I have a very separate way of defining religion and spirituality. So in, in so, my mind... Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I just said, I, go ahead, define this for us. Yeah, I, I guess, um, well, kind of going a little bit back, I reflecting back on when I was young and, and had children, I think it depends on the family pressures that one faces, you know, there can be quite a bit of of societal pressure for, um, you know, bringing your children into some sort of religious education. And I, frankly, I think that was one of the most challenging uh, decisions that I had to make as, as a young parent about <clears throat> what I wanted to do with my children. And, and it came not so much from my own personal beliefs, but from the outside pressures I felt from family. Um, but to me, it, there can be very re deeply religious people that have, at least in my experience, not very spiritually deep, if that makes sense. Mm, true. Yeah, so let, let's just, um, if you don't mind, Shana, just let's just go one step further. So if I'm following, you're talking about organized religion versus spirituality. You're defining religion as sort of a communal kind of thing. I mean, how are you understanding religion, and then how would you define spirituality? Well, when I think of religion, I think of some institution that okay. has a specific set of beliefs or dogma. Whereas, Good. From, I mean, that's that's what I would say too. And then okay. spirituality. It is a, is a, much, a, a much more personal thing. I, uh, um, it's it's how it's you know how one sees oneself in the eternal um, perspective. Okay, nice, nicely put. I mean, th then I think you probably see how the five questions: Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? How should I live? And why fit that spiritual paradigm as you're defining it? It's this personal quest for meaning. Very much so. So, so I, I guess, 
so let me just add one more thing and then we can we can move on and or anyone else can jump in. So what you're saying in response to these charts and what I've said so far is that that a lot of people feel just are, are pressured into a specific religion as opposed to freely choosing it. Is that fair? Uh, or you know, there's some pressure, whether it's from from their family of origin or from their their um, you know family of marriage or from society in general. There's some um, you know some external pressure that that leads them to feel the need to adopt some sort of institutional belief system. Okay, and and I I would cop to that personally. I mean, I would, I'd be interested to hear what. I mean, that's the problem with that. A thing like this where I'm leaving it all open is I'm more curious in what you all have to say than I am in what I have to say because I know what I'm going to say. Uh, but I would, I would cop to that personally. I mean, I was raised Jewish and my parents had no intention of me being anything else. And when I started at the age of 16 to study Zen Buddhism seriously, my father was, I mean, apoplectic and he would tell his friends, you know, he was like, oh, my son is a Zen. That's what he called me, a Zen. Like, that was a noun. My son is a Zen. Uh, and, and actually, my sophomore year of college, I took, I took, I left the country and went to Israel, went to Tel Aviv University just to placate him. So he said, no, so I could say, look, I'm still Jewish. I'm still Jewish. I'm not a Zen. But even with that kind of parental or communal pressure, obviously, we have all these people who are in their, I mean, it goes up, you know, the, 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 the age range of the spiritually independent doesn't stop at 40. I mean, it goes all the way up into the 60s uh, in the study. So there, there are people who clearly were raised, like myself, who were clearly raised in a religion with a lot of parental pressure, continuing parental pressure and expectation. And yet we've found a way, it's just not, for some reason we have to go larger. I mean, I, I don't know what else we want to say about that, but, but just from my own perspective, I, Judaism is too small. Christianity is too small. Hinduism, Buddhism. I, you know, I've I've spent ten years in the Buddhist world, seriously studying and practicing. I've been initiated into the Ramakrishna order of Advaita Vedanta Hinduism. Uh, I've taken Shaktipat with uh, Guru Mai. I mean, I, I collect religious initiations the way other people collect stamps, and and I don't I don't find any of them. Uh, satisfying in and of themselves. I'm, I'm much more interested in um, learning what I can from all of them and then weaving it into my own thing, which brings up a problem that people raise, and, and I want to raise it myself and, and see if we can answer it. And that's the notion of being uh, idiosyncratic or just making up your own religion as you go along. I mean, I would say two things. One, religion is made up as you go along. I mean, it's just that you didn't get to make it up. Dead people made it up. But before they were dead people, they were making it up. So I think it's always invented. But I don't see the problem with weaving together truths, as you would define truth for yourself, into your personal spiritual path. Uh, years and years and years ago, Utney Reader, I don't know if any of you remember Utney Reader, or actually it still exists. Um, let me reader ask the question of a number of spiritual leaders from around the world. Should people mix and match from religions or should they go more deeply into a single religious tradition? And the overwhelming answer was that people should go deeply into one tradition. And I was in the minority and I said that, that no, I didn't think that was necessary at all. And that what people needed to have, and I still think this is true, is not a single label, but a root practice. I think that spirituality is, like Shauna said, I mean, personal, but it's rooted, for me anyway, it's rooted in personal practice, whether it's meditation or prayer or chanting or walking or knitting or whatever your practice is. But it's something that you do on a daily basis and something that, that deepens your awareness of these questions, the answers to these questions, who am I, where did I come from? And you get the answer through your practice. And then the answer that you seem to intuit through your practice, you'll find teachings in other religions, and I'm claiming all of the religions, that will reinforce your own experience. So 
Let me stop for a second. I've got some strange noise. I think somebody's typing loudly. <laughs> I think, or I thought maybe someone's doing worldwide wrestling. It sounds like someone <laughs> slammed on the floor. So, okay, if we can, I don't know what that is, but if, if you, if it happens to be you, don't confess, just mute. <laughs> so. Just don't do it. Stop it. <laughs> Well, no, maybe they're maybe they're typing. I mean, that's fine, but just know that we're all hearing it. So um, I, I was in the minority on that, and, and I, I but I still feel that way, and I think I'm in sync with this growing group of the spiritually independent. So so I, I'm very positive about what's happening. So so let me just let me just leave it at that. Unless someone wants to jump in, let me go ahead and put up the first or the next. I, I have next one question. This is Judith, and I have one just question of clarification. Like when you're talking about the spiritually independent, are you talking about all these different people, or are you just the like the like the ten percent who are looking, or no? I'm I'm talking the, the ten percent. Yeah, thanks. The ten percent who are looking, they're not looking for truth. They're looking for a religion to join. Oh, oh. So okay. they want to be. They're looking for a label. Um, no, I'm talking about the 88% who are uh, who claim to be spiritual. Well, I should be more careful. So some of those uh, are atheists and some of those are agnostic. So I don't know what the actual uh, percentage here, but it, it's somewhere in the 70s, I think. But that large group that is not looking to join something, but is looking for uh, spirituality, for meaning, for purpose, uh, they're looking for something. And what I... I'm offering, I think. Well, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I had I guess one other question, sort of like um, the the 88 percent is 88. Do you know what it's 88 percent of what? What the total? Yeah, these is? are these are. Oh, the actual number. I mean, the number is of, nine. So that this like this whole group of that you're that is broken up into percentages is what percentage of the general population is just. Was, How many people participated in the survey? I, I don't know. The, the estimated number of nuns, uh, religiously unaffiliated and spiritually independent, is 90 million in the United States. That's that's what the number that I that I've read. 90 million people <clears throat> are in that nun category. Oh, okay. I don't like the term. So 90 million. So so we're talking about a large number, uh, and most of them are younger people. And then the idea is that that number will grow as, as their, their numbers grow. So they may just be looking without any kind of, well, they probably are, just looking wherever they're looking and finding whatever they can find. What, what I want to explore with you tonight and then for the next four weeks after that is the perennial philosophy, which I'm claiming is going to become central to the spiritually independent. And here's a picture of Augustina Steku. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it's, I don't even know where we found this picture. Is that a photograph from the uh, 1500s? I don't know. But he's the guy who first coined this term perennial philosophy. And it's uh, the meaning of perennial philosophy is like a perennial bulb. It keeps coming up seasonally. The perennial philosophy is this basic understanding of reality that, re that crops up in every religion across time and around the planet. You can find a Buddhist-flavored version of it in the Hindu one, in the Jewish one, in the Christian one, a Muslim one, uh, etc. And this is the guy who first seemed to notice it and, and named it. Um, and, and this is what it is. Now, there are different definitions. Uh, this one, I... I borrowed and adapted, I think, uh, uh, I, mean, I borrowed and adapted from Aldous Huxley, uh, who has a much more complicated way of saying it, not bullet points. But this is the basic idea of the perennial philosophy, that first of all, there's just one reality. Now, you can call it God or Allah or Brahman or Great Spirit or Hashem, you know, the name Judaism or Adonai, or this infinite number of names. None of the names get at the thing itself. They're just what the Zen people call fingers pointing toward the moon. So none of the names are the moon itself, but 
they're all pointing to the same reality. So having said that, let me now say why people will legitimately jump out of their seats uh, and say, no, 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 that's not right. So there's a wonderful teacher at, I want to say Boston University. Now I can't remember if it's Boston University or Boston College, but I think it's Boston University. Teacher of, in, in, the, in the religion department named Stephen Prothero. And he wrote a book, he's written lots of books, but he wrote a book called God is Not One. And it's a really important book. And in the book, he says that, uh, that people like me are making a, doing a terrible disservice to religion by claiming that God, Allah, um, Adonai, Great Spirit, uh, Brahman, uh, all these things are the same. They're not. And he's talking from what I call the corporate perspective. So uh, it's commonplace to say that, just to pick the Abrahamic religions, that Jews, Christians, and Muslims and Baha'is all worship the same God. That's really not true, not on a corporate level. In other words, if, if you ask a, a rabbi, uh, you know, do you worship the same God as the Christian? And the rabbi is paying attention. The answer ought to be no, because the Jewish God doesn't have a son. And the God, the father of the Christian Trinity cannot be God, the father without the son. God, the father is not your father. That's not why he's called that. He's called God the Father because there is God the Son and then God the Holy Spirit. So the Christian God has a kid. The Jewish God, well, let's come back to that. The Muslim God certainly doesn't have a kid. The Jewish God might have a daughter. He right? definitely doesn't have a son. If you look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, we discover that, that the first thing that God begot was a woman named uh, Chochma in Hebrew, Sophia in Greek, and English, uh, wisdom. And she is... God's first, she's God's daughter. Now, most rabbis won't cop to that, and I don't know how, what they do to get around it, but anyway, that's, that's what they'll say. But certainly, if, even if you got a rabbi who say, yes, God has a daughter, there's a big difference between saying you have a daughter and saying you have a son. So which is it? It can't be, you know, it can't be both, it's, it, you know, unless you're claiming both. So the Jewish God, with or without the daughter, is not the Christian God who definitely has a son. The Jewish God uh, never spoke the Quran to Muhammad in the cave, whereas Allah absolutely spoke to Muhammad in the cave. So Krishna, for example, just to throw one in from, from outside the Abrahamic tradition, Jesus is not Krishna, uh, Allah is not Krishna. You know, the Jewish God never rode in the chariot in front of Arjuna, the, the, the hero of the Bhagavad Gita, and never revealed uh, the divine reality to Arjuna uh, sitting out, you know, standing on the chariot. So they're really different gods. And the same thing is true with their heavens. Heaven is not the same as nirvana. Enlightenment is not the same as salvation. Each religion has its own unique thing. And uh, let me just finish this thought. And if you want to jump in, that's, that's great. So, so from Prothero's perspective, the corporate institutional perspective that Shauna was talking about, has its own understanding of God, its own understanding of chosenness. You know, the people are chosen in, in the Jewish tradition. Um, the Jews have been superseded in many Christianities, and now it's the Christians who are chosen. Uh, uh, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, greater than Moses, greater than you know, the other prophets. So every religion has its own thing going on. And we shouldn't, on the corporate level, flatten them all out and say, God, Allah, Brahman are all the same. It's not fair on that level. Where I think it is fair is on the mystical level, where people who would use terminology, God, Allah, Brahman, etc., know, they know that they're using these terms to point to something that is ineffable. And so they're just pointers. They're not the thing itself. And corporate religion worships the pointer. Mystical religion and certainly the perennial philosophy tries to get beyond the pointer. So I, I just want to be very careful in this first one that, that you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not claiming on the corporate level that all religions are the same. They're not, and we shouldn't make that mistake. Anybody want to jump in on that? 
Okay. But now, now that you clarified it, no, <laughs> I, I, I was trying to get my head around the, uh, the word reality, and initially I thought, well, all we're trying to do is differentiate monotheistic versus whatever, you know, multiple gods. But um, the 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 eyes, the the way of looking at it between corporate and mystical very much makes sense to me. Okay, is that Shauna again? Oh yes. Who was that? Judith. That's Shauna. Okay. So so okay. So that's part of it. The other thing is the one here is not meant in terms of monotheism. When it's it's meant in terms of non-dualism. So when I say there's one reality, I don't mean there's one God out there somewhere. I mean that out there and in here and over there uh, are all part of a singular system. That there is just one, uh, well, I don't, I don't know how to say it other than reality. There's just one reality of which all things are a part. So my favorite metaphor for this is the Hindu metaphor of the ocean and the wave. So the one reality, God, Allah, etc. Uh, imagine that reality as an infinite ocean and everything that you can experience and maybe and everything you can't, I mean dark matter, dark energy, all that, everything that is manifest in the world, imagine all of that as the waves of this singular ocean. So every wave is nothing but the ocean, but no wave is the entirety of the ocean. So making it more personal, you and I are a wave of that cosmic ocean. Uh, we, we are not um, other than God. We are just not all of God. And that's the first, first one. And it leads directly, obviously, to the second. We are manifested uh, from this one reality. We, we arise in God the way a wave arises in the ocean. The extent to which we identify with the oceanic, as opposed to the separate wave, the extent to which we identify with the oceanic is the extent to which you and I feel totally interconnected, part of this singular reality. The way Jesus put it in, in uh, the Gospel according to John, and I think Jesus is a perennialist, I think he understands this, well, let me put it this way, the Jesus that I like, the Jesus that I, that I tease out of the Gospels, uh, is a perennialist. So Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Well, that's another metaphor for ocean and wave. I mean, the vine gives, you know, stretches out, manifests, uh, grows all these branches. So we're branches of the vine, but there's no disconnect. Uh, so in, in Judaism, Shnur Zalman of Liadi in the 1700s like the metaphor of the sun and the rays of the sun. So you, the, God is the sun, and you and I are sunlight, and just an expression of the sun in, in time and space. So that's, that's the second one. The third one, suffering is not necessary. Let, let, me, let me back that up. Let me rephrase that. There's such a thing as unnecessary suffering. Suffering is part of reality, right? If, if you have a terminal disease or you're children get a disease or a loved one gets some, a disease or you lose your job or you lose your retirement income. I mean, that's suffering. There's a difference between losing your job because the capitalist system is designed to screw you. That's unnecessary suffering. And we have to relook, you know, look again at the corruption of capitalism. Allah, what's his name? A guy just wrote this humongous book on the corruption of capitalism. But, uh, that, that, may, that may be unnecessary suffering. And what makes it unnecessary is that if the people who caused the suffering felt, into, uh, felt, to be, felt themselves to be part of this unity and felt themselves in intimate unity with everyone else, they wouldn't screw everyone else. Uh, so that kind of suffering is what I'm talking about when I say suffering is not necessary. But there's a built-in suffering. Um, what you know, the Buddha calls ignorance, uh, not ignorance, sorry, uh, illness, old age, um, things like the accident. Now, th those things are just part of life, and we have to just work with those or not. I mean, we just had this case of um, 
Oh goodness, what was his name? I guess this escaped me. His son committed suicide this weekend. Uh, a guy who wrote Purpose Driven Life. Yeah, Rick Warren. Oh, kid. Rick Warren. Yeah. yeah, so his son was 27 years old and he committed suicide. So, you know, if you go, don't Google it on the internet because what you're going to find on the internet are just all these people blaming Rick Warren uh, for okay. claiming his son is gay and blaming Rick Warren for his anti gay positions, make driving his son to commit suicide. There's so far, anyway, there's no evidence for any of that. It's just people who are angry at Rick Warren and are taking his son's death and using it as a bludgeon to beat the guy with. So, so don't look it up, but at least not on, on regular old internet sites. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that, that kid was suffering and who knows why he was suffering. And I don't know if that suffering is avoidable. That could have been purely biochemical and built into his genetic system. And so I, I don't want to say suffering is avoidable, but unnatural, unnecessary, but there is such a thing as unnatural and unnecessary suffering. And that suffering arises when we exploit one another. And we exploit one another when we believe that we live in a separatist world where you and I are not waves of the same ocean. We are not connected. Uh, and, and it arises when we live in what's called a zero sum reality with a small r. We have a zero sum worldview. Zero sum worldview is like in most sports. There's a winner and there's a loser. So in tennis, if, if you and I are playing tennis, you're, you can't win unless I lose and vice versa. So there's one winner and there's one loser and that's the way it goes. So that's zero sum. Non-zero sum is when I can't win unless you also win. And that's a very different different worldview. And it arises naturally when we realize that we're all part of the same system. Let me go through the last one and then we'll, I'll stop again and see if this is making sense to you. So the fourth part of the perennial philosophy is peace and compassion are, are our true nature. So let me adjust that one too a little bit. I mean, I did this and now I'm rethinking it. I, they're a little too blunt. So peace and compassion are our true nature. Let me, let me put it this way. We have all kinds of things in our nature, peaceful and unpeaceful, compassionate and cruel. But peace and compassion arise naturally when we recognize we're all part of this singular reality. When we get point one and point two, then unnecessary suffering disappears on its own because we no longer act in a way that would cause it to happen. And in its place, we'll find peace, compassion, justice, um, caring, I mean, all, all these positive traits. It's not that we don't have the negative traits. We do. All you have to do is read the newspaper and, and you see that humans have that. But we, but they will not arise in a non-zero-sum world, in a world rooted in this realization that we're all in this together. So let, let me stop and see if that makes sense. Comments, questions for clarification? Anybody? Okay, I will take dead air. As, yeah, go ahead. Well, Somebody well, want to jump in? Bill Khan, you're in Barbara. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Hey, I, I can. I can hear you, Bill. I can see you. And thanks again for lunch yesterday. Oh, <laughs> you're very welcome. You're very yes, welcome. We, there we go. Go. I see you both. Uh, what, what What you're saying makes perfect sense to me. I, I guess the the head shaking wonder I have is if. Peace and compassion are our true nature, and I, I believe that. Uh, why are they so rare? Yeah, I, here's my take on it. I think that they're rare because this non-zero-sum worldview is rare, and that's rare because this understanding of the interconnectedness of everything is so rare. You know, just, just take um, your standard religions. I mean, you know, Judaism, okay? So Judaism is not a zero-sum game. I'm sorry, Judaism is a zero-sum game. There are winners and losers, and the chosen are the big winners. Christianity, in almost all its forms, is a zero-sum game. There are the saved and the damned. Uh, Islam is a zero-sum game. You can even say that, that um, 
You know, Buddhism, even, you know, and I don't know about even, but Tibetan Buddhism is a zero-sum game. If you're not enlightened, you're going to go through some hellish reincarnation experience. Um, there's the, the wise and the ignorant, the, the awake and the asleep, the, the enlightened and the, and the indarkened. It's, it must be built into our, um, well, I was going to say reptilian brain, you know, that the older part of the brain. And that it's only, and this is my guess, this is my hope more than a guess, it's a hope, that in the past there have been rare individuals, Jesus, St. Paul. When, when St. Paul says, uh, and you've heard me say this before, but when St. Paul says uh, there is no Jew or Greek or female, slave or free or slave or free male and female, in Christ Jesus, he's imagining a whole new way of organizing society. That when you enter into the Christian communion, Gender is no longer an issue. Ethnicity is no longer an issue. Uh, your, your social status, your, your uh, wealth or lack of wealth, all of that is, is, is over. And everyone is in this non-zero game where we share everything and we help everyone in our community. Now, the, you know, then he, he imagines the community expanding globally. <clears throat> but it only lasts a short time. By the time Christianity becomes an organized religion, fourth century, Holy Roman Empire, we're back to a zero-sum game where the Christians win, or you know, the, if the Christians are going to win, everyone else has to lose. And then the history of Christianity and Islam battling it out forever, uh, two of the world's most um, strong missionary evangelical religions, they're, they're, they have to clash, they have to fight. Because they now see one, they see themselves in a zero sum world. So, so somehow that just happens to us. Now, maybe it's genetic, maybe it's the old brain, maybe we're evolving out of it. In, in a wonderful book by a guy named Wright, W R I G H T, called The Evolution of God, he talks about this a lot. He's, he's the guy who wrote a book called Zero or Non Zero, and he talks about this whole zero sum, non zero something. But in his newest book, The Evolution of God, he talks about how our understanding of God is maturing into a non-zero worldview. And that my hope is actually independent are more, not all of them, certainly, I mean, I, that would be silly to say that, but, but many of them are inclined to get beyond the boundaries of these zero-sum competing systems where there has to be a winner and at the expense of everybody else, to these non-zero mystical oriented spiritualities where I can't win unless you win. You can't win unless we all win, which I think is very different. So, you know, I, I hate to say I'm optimistic <laughs> because I never, I never really know, but I'm hopeful. That's, that's the direction we're going in. So I'm looking at the clock. We're supposed to end, in the, we're supposed to end in, 15 minutes. Uh, you're, you're just going to have to stay yeah. up late. So I've mentioned the yeah. questions to you before. So who am I? I'm sorry. Somebody want to jump in? I just wanted to jump in. If by chance we get disconnected, we can continue this conversation. We can just log back in if you wanted to extend for 15 more minutes. But Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, I did time this out, and we're going to go right to the first question, and we've explored it. So it's just the texts. So, so these are the okay. five questions again. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? How should I live and why? We're going to look at those over the next four weeks. Now, obviously, why did we do it for five weeks? Well, because when you get to the last question, it takes two seconds. So um, there's not a lot to say there, but that's what we're going to be covering. And lovely slide. Thank you, Wendy and Kathy. Who am I? So I'm just picking texts. And in this case, I just picked them from, from uh, Western tradition. Um, but it was random. And this, this stuff is all from a book that I just last week sent off to my editor at Skylight Paths called Perennial Wisdom for the Spiritually Independent. And it's got a long intro where we go through the stuff you and I have just been talking about. And then I take each of these questions and give you page after page after page after page of text from different traditions, Eastern and Western. And we could find them in science. We don't have to even look at religion, but I, I can find myself to to religious texts. So here's this the one I mentioned in Proverbs 8.22, God is my source and I am God's first creation. The I here 
is a woman. If you read the whole text or you read the text in context, this is Lady Wisdom speaking. But from the perennial point of view, the I here is you and me. So what she says about herself in the Gospel of John, we'll see a bunch of them, what Jesus says about himself. These are paradigmatic statements that we want to grow into so that we can say them meaningfully uh, and experientially about ourselves. So that I want you to be able to say at some point, God is my source. And, and know that to be the case, just like you know that, um, you know, uh, foam on the head of beer comes from the beer. You just know that that's, you pour the beer in a glass and it foams. God extends in time and space and it's me and it's you. To get to that level of knowledge, uh, for some, like myself, maybe text is enough. But, you know, meditation practice is probably what gets you there. Um, this weekend, I was part of a, a team at what's what, what we call the One River Wisdom School. And we were looking at the same material, same texts, actually. And we would study for an hour, and then there'd be meditation for an hour, and, and sort of weave meditation and, and uh, Qigong practice throughout the entire weekend, because you have to embody this truth. That's where Qigong comes in. And you have to uh, melt into it or be, you know, have it, permeate you and that's where meditation comes in. So there are many levels that, that we would want to know these things to make them, to realize the truth in our lives. But here we're, we're doing what, what I would call jhana yoga, you know, knowledge yoga, study yoga. So we're planting the seeds in our heads and we'll see where they, where they go. But here that's from, from the book of Proverbs. Here's the gospel according to John. In the beginning there was Logos and Logos was with God and Logos was God. If you pick up any uh, standard English translation of the New Testament, it's going to say, in the beginning was the word. And that's a terrible translation of logos. Uh, logos is closer to Tao in the Chinese tradition, if that helps you. In fact, in the Chinese translation of, or a Chinese translation of the uh, Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning there was Tao. And Tao was with God, and Tao was God. They, they really saw that connection. And Tao is the way the universe is and how we should live in, in connection with it. So how do I live? We'll, we'll, get, we'll pick up that aspect of Taoism and, and uh, other traditions in the third question. But here, again, it's before there was anything, there was this reality. And the reality is identified with God, and ultimately the reality becomes flesh, as the New Testament tells us. And they want, and Christians will then identify that flesh with Jesus. But I want to say, no, no, don't do that. Jesus is just a paradigm. Identify that flesh as your flesh. So back to Proverbs. Here's another one. Uh, before time, I am. Before beginnings, I am. So the I am is you that when you realize that you are a manifestation of God and God is timeless, there's something timeless about you. There was no oceans uh, when I was born, no springs deep and overflowing. I'm older than mountains, elder to hills, the valleys, the fields. Before the first lumps of clay emerged, I am. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So, you know, they're separated by centuries, these, these texts, Proverbs and Jesus a couple of centuries at least, and they're both coming up at the same point. Now you can say, well, wait, Jesus knew Proverbs, and he's drawing from it, but that's fine, because I, I'm, I believe that Jesus is speaking truth, that he's not just saying, okay, I'm going to bamboozle these people and claim something that isn't true. I think that when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, he's experiencing his uh, non duality his unity with the oceanic, timeless, infinite, divine. And then he realizes, yeah, I've, I've been around, not as Jesus, not as Rami, not as you know your egoic self, but I've been around forever. I had this guy at the university, Middle Tennessee State University, uh, Carter Phipps. I, I love dropping books on you, so 
might get interested in taking a look at these things. Carter Phipps has just written a book called Evolutionaries. And he came to the university, it's a great book, and he gave a wonderful talk. And he said that, that we keep looking back at the Adam and Eve story, for example, he's talking to a largely Christian audience. We keep looking back at the Adam and Eve story and say, ah, that was the best time. He says, the evolutionary perspective is to realize that you are the cutting edge, we humans, are the cutting edge of consciousness that has been maturing for 13.8 billion years. We are not just, you know, I'm 62. I'm not really 62. I'm 13.8 billion years old because my consciousness is, is a product of that evolution. And I'm simply a contemporary expression of that, but a unique one, well, unique in the egoic sense also, but unique in the sense that I can see that I am that expression of 13.8 billion years of evolutionary development that we humans may be the only animal. I don't know if I really believe that. I'm, I'm very into humpback whales and elephants being also quite intelligent. Um, and you know, while Shauna's dogs may be dumb as a post, not all dogs are. <laughs> and hers probably aren't either. But anyway, that, that we humans are a leading way and maybe the only way that nature has become self-conscious. How, I mean, how amazing is that? When I think of myself as 62, then I think, well, how long do I have left? Right? I had my, my physical uh, this morning, and so I don't have long <laughs> left unless I go on a diet. But, uh, you know, how, so how long do I have left? I mean, let's say on the off chance, my Zen master Suzaki Roshi is like 106. So let's say I went like that, you know. So, so I have a few decades left. But they'll, I'll eat them up pretty quick. But if I realize that I'm 13.8 billion years old and I'm part of that, when my physical form dies, the consciousness that has been developing for 13.8 billion years isn't going away. I'm just an expression of that. The, the wave returns to the ocean and the ocean keeps waving. We'll talk about reincarnation and things like that when we get to um, you know, where, where am I going in the third question. But um, just to realize the oceanic me as opposed to the wave me. That oceanic me is, is billions of years old and it's going to continue on. So it takes you out of this narrow focus of the ego without erasing the ego or, you know, trying to kill it. I'm not talking about ending the ego. I'm simply realizing the ego is simply a blip on this much larger reality. Here's a book called The Wisdom of Jesus Ben Sirach, different Jesus, a Jewish guy living probably in Egypt, wrote in Greek. Uh, his, he did, his book is lost. Um, he actually wrote in Hebrew. His, the original is lost. His grandson wrote a Greek translation of it, and we don't have the original. But and he says something similar. Before time, at the beginning of beginnings, God created me, and I shall remain forever. And again, he's talking about wisdom, but I'm saying it, it applies to us. And then in the prophet Jeremiah says, blessed are you who trusted in me and me alone. You are like trees rooted near water. Your leaves are evergreen and yield fruit in its season. You have no fear of drought. When we are plugged into the oceanic reality, we have this, oh, you know, this, this transcendent, this, this eternity element. We realize this eternity element to us. We're never alone. You and I are all connected and then we're connected to the ocean. Uh, because we're connected to the ocean, we always have that energy flowing through us. That's why we can be evergreen and yield fruit in its season, and we never have to fear drought, because we're part of, a, of an ongoing system. So let me just get you back to that first question. The answer is, you're God, using that language. The answer is, tat tvam asi in Sanskrit, thou art that, that being Brahman. You're, you're Brahman. You're the Logos. You're, you know, the, you're Allah. Um, in the opening line of the Islamic Shahada, the, the opening line of the affirmation of faith, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. And the Sufi commentary on it says, it's not that there's just no God other than Allah. There's no thing other than Allah. You're it. 
I'm it. The universe is it. Look out the window and you're seeing God. In the book of Job, Job says, in my flesh, I see God. And that's what we're talking about, that kind of knowing. So you can see your body and see the divine manifest. Or if you don't like God language, I mean, you see your body and you see 13.8 million years of, of evolutionary consciousness manifesting in your, in your physical form. I don't want to be too blunt, but if that doesn't blow your mind, nothing you're going to say this week will. I mean, that's so amazing. That is so amazing to me. All right, so I'm going to stop, and we'll see what happens to us if there, if there are comments, questions, and we can see if they cut us off in the next 60 seconds. <laughs> Anybody want to jump in? Yes, um, I will jump in. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. who, who are we talking to? I'm Betty. Hi, Betty. Hi. Um, I'm a very interesting uh, talk. And I'm very close, I don't know very close, but I, I understand from an experiential point of view a lot of things that you're sharing. And I consider myself a Taoist Jew. Uh, and I have also explored other ways of seeing God uh, and, uh, and experiencing God. And I feel that um, the process of evolution is going on all the time. I heard it from a bar mitzvah kid in my synagogue who said that, that evolution is built into the Torah. I mean, like the changes as as we mature, it must be that God matures because the changes we experience are changes that grow our humility and our peace. And the man who said that peace is, Peace and uh, well, how do you put it? The, it's so rare. But if it's so rare, how come we all know it? We all are familiar with it. It's more out there and in here than we realize. We we every one of us has experienced peace and comfort and security from time to time. Yeah, and and, and I think we experience it more if we if we were more in touch with that. Oceanic self, or, or, or you know, the Taoist sensibility that you're talking about. But but yeah, just well, we let me. Missed, I just want to say one more thing. We missed an opportunity when the astronauts took a picture of the Earth from space, from the moon. Uh, uh, an opportunity to teach how we're all part of one thing. And, and yeah, I, I, I so, mourn that. I think it's an opportunity that's unfulfilled. Well, okay. Let, let me let me speak to that because that happens to be a pet. I don't know if the word is peeve of mine, but but I don't, that's the wrong word probably because I'm not so negative. I think that when they, in what, 69, I think, they turned, in the late 60s, they turned the camera on the Earth. We saw the Earth as this um, pale blue dot, I think Carl Sagan called it, against the blackness of space. We didn't see the divisions of ethnicity and nationality and all that stuff. And like you said, we it was the ultimate teaching moment. I, I would say, metaphorically, don't get too literal, it was a revelation from the divine. It was another um, breakthrough, no less profound than Muhammad receiving the Quran in the cave or the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai or, or the Buddhist enlightenment. I mean, this was a breakthrough for the entire planet. Maybe the first time, you know, Moses... And the Jews were there, Muhammad and, and the people in Saudi Arabia, you know, what, Arabia then. Um, but this was televised. You know, the, the, revel the revelation will be televised. I mean, this is now iconic. Now, here's where maybe uh, I'm a little more Pollyanna-ish than you are. I think it takes a long time for these revelations to sink in. So I'm hopeful it's still working in the zeitgeist, that it's still out there. You see the image everywhere. I think it's working on the collective unconscious of the of the, of the species. I hope so, because that's Wonderful so. God. In my in my synagogue, well, I'll just say this way: in my synagogue, we had flags. We had the American flag, we had the Israel flag, we had the flag of Jerusalem, and we had the Earth flag, which is that blue blue dot. And I said those were you know some of our allegiances. 
I would have had more flags if I had more space. But those, you know, I wanted people to sit there and say, yeah, we're Americans. Yes, we're Jews, but we're also um, earthlings. And, and I think that's so important, both from a feminist um, goddess perspective, but also from, from this, this iconic image that was revealed to us by, um, you know, it was, it was always there for us to see. And then we had to evolve to the point where we could get out there and actually see it. So, so I, I, I think something amazing is happening. If you, I guess we can still go on a little bit. So let's only add two things. What happens is when you, when you see that image, and this is a good way to bring this to a close, when you see that image, how can you possibly say, uh, okay, now I'm going to opt for a zero-sum religious view? That here's this image without nations. It's what Buckminster Fuller called planet ocean. It looks like a, almost a, an, uh, an unbroken body of land surrounded by a singular ocean that we divide up into different things, but not in, in actuality. We just make that division. And how can, how can you see that and then say, oh, Jews are chosen and others are not? Or, oh, these, these Christians are saved and other people are not? I mean, it makes no sense. But it took us, you know, I, I can't do the math, but 13 point something billion years <laughs> up to 1967, 8, 9, whenever it was, to, to see that. So I, I think that's a, revela a revelation. I think there are others. I think the return of the Divine Mother in Catholicism, in Judaism, in, in uh, almost every religion with the exception of Islam, which is having a difficult time trying to find that, though Rumi brings her in. But the Divine Feminine in, in all these religions is making a comeback. I think that's another revelation. There's stuff happening, but it's happening outside the box so that people are becoming just, and this is my last point, just what you said, hyphenated. So you're a Taoist Jew, and there's Buddhist Jews, and there's Hindu Jews. And, you know, from the Jewish point of view, you can be all those things, but not a Christian Jew, even though those are the only ones that actually have historical uh, reality to it. But at this point in my life, I'm completely hyphenated. I'm Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, agnostic, atheist, scientist. You know, I guess it depends on, you know, what we're talking about. I draw from the wisdom of all these things, and that's... Now, this is on the Holy Rascal website. You know, that's what a Holy Rascal is. And, and that's what a, I think the best of the spiritually independent are. And the perennial philosophy will become a foundation for that because I think it speaks to and from that directly. Okay, so we, we are out of time. Uh, so that was probably a good, good place to end. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll all stay on for the next four weeks. We'll go through the rest of the questions. Uh, you can see what they are again. And, uh, you know, we'll continue this conversation. Let me just ask Kathy and Wendy if, if people who are on now, if you like it, and I hope you did, and you're coming back and you tell other people, can other people, how do you, can you still get in, or is this a closed deal now? No, people can still get in. It's just going to be $60 payment for the next three. We'll just we'll just change the price and uh, send a recording. Okay. Right, we really and that's what we're doing. We're re yeah, we're recording. Yeah, so it's just the webinar. And, and we're everyone gets we're a copy, or there's a way to get a copy. Everyone gets a copy. Everyone gets a copy. <laughs> so, and we really want to thank everyone for supporting Rami and the Holy Rascals and joining us tonight and. Like we've got more stuff coming up, really great stuff coming up too. So, and if any of you are technical wizards, call us. Send us an email. <laughs> we, we could use a technical angel. <laughs> yeah, but you did a great job. Thank you very much to to, to Wendy and to Kathy. It, it worked. We panicked right up to the last minute, but it did work. Yes. Rami from Bill and I Thank you. Thank well, you thank, for thank you all. The yeah, thank you very much, and we'll see you next Monday. Bye. See you Good next night. week. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.